So today we're going to talk about the roots and the issues of apartheid in South Africa. So today we're going to talk about how did apartheid impact South Africa. So what I'm going to be doing today is giving you some background into how apartheid came to be in South Africa and how um, various different groups within South Africa began to resist apartheid itself. So the first question is how did apartheid begin? So in 1910, South Africa wins self-rule from Great Britain. Um, South Africa was the richest nation in Africa uh, with its large amounts of natural resources and it was considered a settler colony like Kenya we mentioned before and Algeria um, and so there was a large number of British and Dutch settlers who had permanently lived in South Africa. After World War II many blacks began moving into the cities and the towns in South Africa and were beginning to demand more rights and in 1948 the Afrikaner, now Afrikaner spelled A-F-R-I-K-A-N-E-R, -E the Afrikaners were the white South Africans. In 1948, the Afrikaner National Party won a majority in the parliament and began to pass laws that became known as apartheid. And so a statement from the South African, the Afrikaner National Party um, when they were gaining power in 1948, they said the party believes that a definite policy of separation, apartheid, between the white races and the non-white racial groups and the application of that policy of separation also in the case of non-white racial groups is the only basis on which the character and future of each race can be protected and safeguarded and on which each race can be guided so as to develop its own national character, aptitude, and calling. So this political party, which gained power in 1948, believed that all of the races, all the various different groups within South Africa, should be very much separate. Um, so we see that the, all these various different laws that really make up apartheid really begin to come into place in 1948. That being said, there definitely was, prior to 1948, discrimination and separation of, for separation of the races prior to that, but it wasn't a formalized organized system of government. And the whole system of apartheid um, gets dismantled between 1990 and 1993. Um, and the first democratic all-race elections in South Africa was held in 1994. So when you think about it, not that long ago. And the whole purpose of apartheid was to form a legal framework for the economic and political dominance by people of European descent in South Africa. So the rules of apartheid meant that people were legally classified into a racial group. The main ones being black, white, colored, which would be like a mixed race, and Asian. And the Asians would be either Indians and or Pakistanis. And each were separated um, with different laws that they had to follow. So in practice, this prevented non-white people, even if they were an actual resident or citizen of South Africa from having a voice or influence and basically restricting their rights. So this really, like I said before, goes back to um, really Dutch rule in South Africa. The Dutch are the ones who really kind of started this policy because when the Dutch took over South Africa, they, or took over the region, you know, started the Cape Colony in going all the way back to the 1600s, they used the African people um, for slave labor. They pushed the African people onto reservations. So some of the laws that were passed when, um, when this all started in 1948 is there's, first off, there was laws prohibiting mixed race marriages. And like I said, everyone was separated um, by race. And then there was the creation of what's known as the Separate Amenities Act. And that was done in 1953. And that created separate facilities, separate beaches, separate buses, separate hospitals, separate schools, and separate universities. Now, also prior to these laws, these formal laws being passed in 1948, the various different groups had to carry passes, and the passes um, kind of gave you permission to be in certain areas. These existing pass laws were tightened, and people that were classified as blacks or colored had to carry identification papers with them at all times. And this was kind of almost like a passport, which prevented the migration of blacks or coloreds into the white areas of South African uh, South Africa. So blacks were prohibited from living or even visiting in white towns without specific permission. Um, for blacks that were living in the cities, um, they were restricted 
only people who were employed in the city could live there. So direct family members were excluded. So say the father went to the city, got a job. He couldn't bring his wife and children with him. His wife and children have to stay back in the countryside because they would not be given um, the ability to, they wouldn't be given passbooks and be allowed to be in the, in the cities. We also start to see that whatever voting rights um, blacks and coloreds did have was removed. And so in 1956, we have the Separate Representation of Voters Act, and that basically took everybody who was not white off of the voter rolls in South Africa. So under this system, non-whites were not allowed to run businesses or professional practices in those areas that were designated as white South Africa. They had to move on to separate what we refer to as homelands and they had to set up their businesses and their practices there. Now the homelands were basically areas of poor quality land, um, almost kind of like what we did to the Native Americans and pushing them onto reservations. So you know the vast majority of the population of South Africa are being pushed onto these small, um, like I said, homelands. Very crowded together, very marginalized, marginalized land, very you know, poor living conditions where the people are basically living in almost like shanty towns. Transport and civil facilities were segregated. There were black bus, there were buses that black people could ride on. They were known as green buses because they had a green marker on the front windscreen and they stopped at black bus stops. And then there were separate bus stops for the white people. And on trains, the first and second class carriages were for whites only, third class carriages were blacks only. Hospitals and ambulances were segregated, and the white hospitals were generally of relatively good quality um, with well-educated staff and ample funds, while well, the black hospitals were seriously understaffed and underfunded, um, and many black areas did not have any hospitals at all. Um, and like I said before, blacks were excluded from living or working in white areas unless they had a specific pass. Only blacks with what were called Section 10 rights, um, those who migrated to the cities before World War II, were excluded from this provision. Technically, whites were also to carry passes in black areas, but that never was actually enforced. So a pass was issued only to a black person with approved work. So like I said before, spouses and children were left behind in non-white areas. So many black, white households had uh, black people as domestic workers, and they were allowed to live on premises, um, but they weren't allowed to have their children with them. So if you got caught without a valid pass, you were subject to an immediate arrest and trial. Um, you would then be deported to your homeland. Um, so basically, if you got caught in an area you weren't supposed to be, you got sent back to what was designated as your homeland. If you um, like forgot your, your paperwork one day, you could get caught and get in trouble. Black people were not allowed to employ white people. Um, and you could see, I'll show you a chart that kind of really kind of outlines some of this inequality. So the population of South Africa, this is from 1978. There was 19 million blacks and only 4.5 million whites. So clearly the blacks had a very large majority over the whites. However, that night, that 19 million people, they only controlled 13% of the land. Well, the whites, 4.5 million, 87% of the land. The blacks got less than 20% of the national income. The whites got 15 so for every $1 a black person made, a white person made 14. Um, the minimum taxable income, you could see they made less money. Um, for every 44,000 black people, there was one doctor. For every 400 white people, there was one doctor. So as a result, the infant mortality rate was incredibly high, 20% in urban areas and 40% in rural areas, as opposed to 2.7% amongst the whites. And the South African government, now again, this was back in 1978, but the South African government spent $45 a year to educate a black child and spent $696 a year to educate a white child. Teacher to student ratio for every teacher that was 22 white children for every black teacher that was 60 um, black children. So you can see here this was completely unequal. Um, so basically they were not being educated on the same way. Um, the Bantu Education Act specifically was said that blacks were only allowed to learn skills they would need in working for whites. So they were not really given access to higher or even secondary education. Black police were not allowed to arrest whites, even if they committed a crime in a black area. 
Blacks were not allowed to buy alcohol. Most of these areas that were labeled as homelands um, rarely had plumbing or any type of electricity. So you could see here, these are uh, gentlemen holding their passbooks. And you could see everything was separated. The beaches were separated. Everything was segregated and separate. Um, so the homeland system, though, was particularly harmful. Like I said, the vast majority of the land was belonged to by whites, and very few little bit of land was allowed for the blacks. And this, this was done through a series of forced removals going on through the 1960s, 70s, and into the early 80s. So the government implemented a policy of what was known as resettlement uh, to force people to move to their designated group areas. Uh, some people argue that about 3.5 million people were moved during this time period. Um, one of the biggest incidents of this, the most publicized, occurred in the city of Johannesburg. So Johannesburg is a major city in South Africa where 60,000 people were moved um, to a new township. Now, within Johannesburg, there had been a neighborhood um, called Sophia Town. And up until 1955, it had been one of the few urban areas where blacks were allowed to own lands. And it was developing into a multiracial settlement. Um, it was the home of a rapidly expanding black workforce because it was convenient to Johannesburg. Um, it had the only black swimming pool for black children in Johannesburg. It was one of the oldest black settlements in Johannesburg. Um, and there was a population of about 50 to 60,000 people living in that area. And it was a pretty vibrant, um, unique area. And... Basically, the government removed the people from that town beginning on uh, February 9th, 1955, under the Western Areas Removal Scheme. So basically, early hours in the middle of the night, armed police entered Sophia Town, forced the residents out of their homes, loaded their belongings onto government trucks, and they were forced to live in a um, noose area. Sophia Town was destroyed by bulldozers and a new white suburb named Triumph was built in its place. And so this is kind of the pattern we see um, within the country as the blacks were more and more disenfranchised, uh, marginalized, and pushed out of their homes. So how did the black South Africans try to resist this system of apartheid? So an organization um, that was called the ANC, or the African National Congress, uh, this is going to be the Congress. This is going to be the organization that Nelson Mandela is going to be a part of. Uh, so, in 1949, they developed an agenda that advocated open resistance in the forms of things like strikes, public disobedience, and protest marches. Um, and this continued throughout the 1950s. Every once in a while, the violent the the clashes would become violent, but for the most part, this was their uh, version of you know civil disobedience um, and nonviolence. Now. Over time, it begins to evolve into something different. But one of the biggest ish, biggest events that happened um, during this time period that is kind of known, like stands out during this time period, was something called the Sharpeville Massacre. Um, so in 1960, a group of disenchant disenchanted, meaning uh, a group of ANC members who were kind of disenchanted with what was happening and they felt that things needed to be moved faster. They wanted to sever all time to the white government and they broke away and they formed a more militant group uh, called the Pan-Africanist Congress. And their one of their major agendas was kind of protesting the passbook laws. So on March 21st, 1960, a bunch of black people congregated in Sharpsville um, to demonstrate against the requirement for blacks to carry identity cards. So the crowd, the estimates of the crowd vary. Some say 5,000, some say 20,000. But the crowd converged on a local police station. They were singing and offering themselves up for arrest for not carrying their passbook. So it was an act of civil disobedience. And a group of about 30, excuse me, 300 police opened fire on the demonstrators. 69 were killed, 186 were injured. All of the victims were black. Most of them had been shot in the back as they were running away. And the crowd was unarmed. And many witnesses said that the crowd was not violent. Um, and so that the police were saying that hordes of natives were surrounding the police station. If they do these things, they must learn their lesson the hard way. And this became known as the Sharpsville Massacre. In the aftermath, the government bans the ANC and the Pan-Africanist Congress. Um, 
Now, this was kind of a powerful factor in the realization that, unfortunately, nonviolent methods were not working. And the ANC actually decided to take up armed resistance against the government. So from 1961 on, they still did peaceful protest actions and consumer boycotts, but they also did terrorist tactics such as intimidation, bombing, murder, and sabotage. So eventually, the organization has to kind of go underground. Now... In 1964, Nelson Mandela and uh, seven others were sentenced to life imprisonment for terrorism. And Nelson Mandela is going to wind up serving about 30 years in prison before he's ultimately um, set free. But now what this picture is, this isn't even of the Sharpsville massacre. This is something in some ways of even worse. Um, so during the 1970s, resistance were beginning again to kind of gain um, steam. So there was a group called the South African Students Organization, led by a group led by a man named Steve Biko, B-I-K-O. And he was a medical student, um, and he was a movement. He was the leader of the South Africa's Black Consciousness Movement. So, in 1974, the government issued the Afrikaners Medium, Medium Decree, which forced all schools for blacks to use the Afrikaans language um, for instruction. And a lot of people were very upset about this um, because the Black people were not consulted. In fact, the Minister of Education said, I have not consulted the African people on the language issue, and I'm not going to. An African might find that the big boss spoke only Africans or spoke only English. It would be his disadvantage, it'd be to his advantage to know both languages. And this policy was deeply unpopular because the blacks felt that this was the language of the oppressor. So on April 30th, 1976, the students at the school at Orlando West Junior High in Soweto went on strike. They refused to go to school. Their rebellion spread to other schools in Soweto. Soweto is a, a neighborhood, a black neighborhood in South in uh, Johannesburg. The students organized a mass rally uh, for June 16th, and the 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 rally turned violent. The police responded with bullets. The students were throwing stones, and the police responded to the stones with bullets. And this picture, um, actually, the first student to be shot was 15 years old. But this picture is the image of Hector Peterson who was killed at age 12. Um, the official death toll of the day was 23 dead, including two children, but some place it as high as 200. And this triggered widespread violence throughout South Africa. Um, in September of 1977, Biko was arrested and he was beaten by police until he lapsed into a coma. He was not given medical treatment for three days and he eventually died. So what we see happening is that the black people of South Africa are becoming less and less willing to be bullied, to be intimidated by the white South African government. And the white South African government is responding with greater and greater violence. Eventually what's going to happen is South Africa really basically is going to become a police statement um, where people, where it just, the, the amount of violence that is needed to be employed by the South African government becomes more and more intense as the people become less and less willing to put up with the apartheid itself. There was a substantial minority of white people who opposed South Africa, although the majority of white South Africans supported this system. But um, there was instances of whites in South Africa who were working with organizations to try to stop the system, but unfortunately not as many as you would hope. But like I said, um, apartheid finally comes to an end in 1990, 1994 with the first all-race elections. We're going to talk more about this in class. Um, oops, sorry, we'll talk about this in class. I just want to show you a picture of Nelson Mandela while he was in prison. Um, and so we're going to pick up with how exactly South Africa uh, apartheid came to an end. We'll pick up with that um, in class.